Okay, welcome to Inhalance Engineering. Today we're going to put together the enclosure. Um, we're going to talk about my design choices and some design philosophy and then uh, the oversights on this initial enclosure prototype. Buckle up, bitch. <clears throat> okay, this is wrapped in a towel just because... Um, I flew to Canada and I thought I was going to work on it in Canada, but I didn't. Um, so it ended up being, I paid for the carry on and I never used it. So that was a bit of a waste. Check out this knife that I'm kind of working on. I got it from the uh, same water jet place. Someone had made this or ordered this and then never paid him. So he gave it to me. Isn't that crazy? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the workshop. to talk about my basic design choices when going into this because the design process for it was pretty long. I wanted the basic design to look like a classic Moog synth. I know people say Moog, but I think it's Moog. I don't really have much experience with synthesizers, so I don't even know the one that it looks most like. But I actually kind of thought that was a useful perspective. Um, if I don't know what it's called and I don't know anything about it, but I can still recognize the shape, there must be something denotative about that design language that other equally uninformed people will still be able to understand what it is. That's one of the design concepts that's been more interesting to me throughout this project. There's a lot that needs to be immediately understood by somebody viewing it when it's done. and if they don't understand it immediately, it won't be of any interest. You know, I can make it as complicated, as unique and special as I want, but if that's not obvious to people without an explanation, then I think something's kind of lost. So for example, the fact that it's built around 80s video game hardware is one of the biggest gimmicks. And that needs to be clear to people um, visually, otherwise it's kind of a waste. Like if I, this would be a lot, easier for me to play live if I put a bigger screen on it uh, instead of looking at the little Game Boy screen. And that's actually possible, but I chose not to do it, mostly because I haven't figured out how, uh, but we're not going to talk about that right now because I'm making a flowery point about how important it is that I chose to use the actual Game Boy and still have it visible. Basically, if I want to have all the obsessive and meticulous work that I've put into this be appreciated, the design needs to communicate some of what makes it a unique instrument. And I think that's an interesting bit of design philosophy. So that communicative design language is part of the reason for me choosing that classic synth design. Also, I think it's just a functional shape. But given that I chose that design, there's a lot of constraints with this thing because I, I'm building it using existing pieces of hardware. So the first thing I did was decide on what needed to be included. And that's a Game Boy, the NES Advantage, a small MIDI keyboard, which we talked about last episode, the Behringer mixer, the Chaos Pad, a patch bay, my bass amp, a DI box, a noise gate, and the power supplies for all those devices, and then space for routing all the cables between all the different components, and then extra space for things that I didn't account for. And that's probably the most important thing. It took me a while to figure out a nice way to actually arrange everything. Here's an early design when I was wrestling with how to consolidate everything into one piece. I was originally gonna have everything just side by side, and then I considered like a fold out uh, sampler pad. I was going to use this Akai beat pad thing that stored the samples internally, but that was pretty ugly if you ask me. 
and that device actually kind of sucks. Initially, I really wanted to keep the thickness of the base down because I kept thinking it would be too thick, but now looking at it, I think I've got a few inches um, to work with that I could add on the bottom without it looking weird. And I think I need to do that, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Anyway, I made a big spreadsheet with the necessary routing and the measurements of the pieces, and this gave me a bit of direction. But it's difficult to know where to start with something like this because there's so many things that need to be accommodated for. Um, you're kind of forced to redesign all the aspects of it multiple times in the early stages just because the way everything is fitting together depends on the way everything else fits together. So it's a little problematic that way. Um, and a lot of projects are like that. So in the early stages of it, all that I had was what I knew need to be included. So I didn't have a great idea of how I wanted everything arranged. And then I also didn't have like a clear way to proceed forward and clear steps as to how I would figure that out. So I have the components here in a little spreadsheet the design requirements here, dimensions here, and the inputs and outputs of those devices. I also included whether or not those would need to be accessible externally or not. Um, so for example, the DI box is going to be connected to the mixer 100% of the time. So I don't need external access to that, if that makes sense. Before I could start designing from a usability standpoint, though, I needed to understand what I was constrained by. Uh, and that's the routing of the devices. The signal chain needs to be in a certain order and I needed to know that order before I could start doing anything. I mean, with this design, I want to minimize the amount of internal cabling and crossed up wiring. So the components need to be arranged roughly sequentially. So I drew out the signal chain of the components. This chart reads left to right and top to bottom. Everything starts at the Game Boy because that's the sound source. And then it goes through the various components in different directions. This ended up not being exactly how I did things, but that's just the nature of the design process, I think. But I had a military general come in to speak at work and he made an interesting point about the reason that the military habitually runs drills for everything they can think of. Even if it's like really unlikely scenarios, they're constantly running drills for everything. His point was that the activity of planning itself is valuable for its own sake because it gives you a better understanding of the moving parts of whatever you're doing. But he said that you should always expect the actual situation or project to go completely differently than you planned um, and by pretty huge variances. He wasn't talking about this stupid project of mine, obviously. <laughs> uh, he was talking about some crazy shit he's experienced in the military. I'm sure he'd be sad to hear that it helped me design a useless instrument, but that was an interesting point to me, and I've, uh, I think I've applied that here. So my takeaway from this portion of the planning was that in the early stages of a plan, you have to understand the constraints, and that's the right place to start when you're designing something. So I've kind of carried that throughout the project, um, and I think that's what people mean when they talk about engineering is problem solving. You have to understand the problems first, and what needs to be overcome. So when you're starting something and you don't know where to begin, start with the constraints. Um, start with the limits of your design first, the things that have to be worked around, and then you can go from there. So once I understood how everything worked in relation to each other and what my constraints were, and once I'd settled on a body style, it's divided into two sections, right? The control surface and the uh, dashboard. And then there's the internals, but the dashboard is that top portion there that has the display and all my uh, mixing knobs and stuff like that. And then um, I decided that everything I'd need to interact with musically would be on the control surface section here on the bottom. That way I can interact with it like a keyboard or a laptop and then I can control the knobs and dials and shit on top um, like I'm piloting a spaceship or whatever. <laughs> I also knew that the Game Boy and the arcade stick need to be in line and in the center so that I can program on it comfortably. Uh, and that means that the chaos pad has to be on one side of the arcade stick and the keyboard need to be on the other side. So on the first Lame Boy, the keyboard was on the right and I'm right-handed. So I put the keyboard on the right side on this and then that decided the arrangement of the control surface because I just had to put the chaos pad on the left. As far as the placement of my amp, um, it's also too big to be anywhere else but the bottom. And I basically have three 
measurement parameters I have to decide on, which is the width of the console, the height of the dashboard, and then the depth of the control surface. So there's other dimensions I have to consider, obviously, but those are the ones most constrained by the components themselves. They're all dictated by the size of the largest component that they contain, except for the width, which is dictated by the combined width of the three devices. This was how I approached the design, working around what I already knew, which was the size of my devices. So the tallest item in the dashboard is the Behringer mixer. Um, that was the tallest thing that I had that was going to go up there. And I had to debate between whether or not I wanted it on the lower um, portion, but I'm glad I didn't do that. And because that's the tallest that decided the minimum vertical dimension of the dashboard and it accommodates some variance and um, some oversight in my design. Something I'm trying to make sure I do is, is accommodate for mistakes. The depth of the base also has to be no shorter than the amp, but I also wanted to accommodate an upgraded amp because I play through a GK MB Fusion 500, which I love, but once we get famous, I'll probably upgrade to the Fusion 800. Um, it's the same width, but it's longer. So it gave me a pretty good idea of what I needed to accommodate in the design and where things were going to be placed. And then that's how I came up with this arrangement. And I'm going to redo the enclosure a little bit, but this general arrangement is going to stick. So I also just guessed on the angle for the dashboard, but it turned out to be good for viewing when standing and it still works okay for sitting. But the viewing angles on the Game Boy's display are pretty bad. Having the enclosure in my hands is pretty fucking cool. Um, watching everything go together like I designed it is pretty satisfying. I, I don't really have much to compare it to. It's way more precise than anything I've ever built. But anyway, I've found a few design oversights that are going to need to be changed. I initially thought I was going to have to bite the bullet and uh, keep whatever mistakes I made on this. I thought I had one shot at the enclosure because it was going to be expensive for me to cut it again because um, I sort of struck a deal on it. But I don't think the lack of ornateness of the enclosure really does justice to the creative potential that I have with the CNC and the water jet. So I'm grateful that I've cultivated this, cultivated this relationship with the fabrication studio. So as far as oversights, I hate this square vent on the side here but I know that'll give the best airflow. So I'm back and forth on whether or not to keep it as a square or mimic the opposite side or do something else. I'd also like to engrave some complex patterning into the entire enclosure. And this plywood is cool because if you cut right to the glue layer, you get a nice contrast with the natural wood color and then you get this dark wood color as well. On the back here, I'd like to have our logo or the lane boy name be cut into the back of it and lit so that I can set it up so it strobes when it's in the dark. Uh, and then I think I'll use something other than plywood for the rails that I mount the uh, actual metal plates to. So on real Eurorack synths, there's like an aluminum rail system with little screws in it that slide around. It kind of feels like it's going to be annoying to install, but it's going to save me a bunch of space and maybe a little bit of weight as opposed to using these pieces of wood. And that's pretty much it as far as stuff that I want to edit. To be honest, I'm surprised there aren't more because there's always more and you get feature creeping. But I haven't found that I've been doing that. I kind of expected some of these issues and I accommodated for most of them. Uh, that's pretty much it for the enclosure. I'm pretty stoked on how it turned out. In the next video, we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about all the wiring and all the actual problems I have to overcome. The enclosure is one thing, but there's some parts of the electronics that I, I don't have an idea for how to solve yet. So hopefully as I release these videos, some more people can give me some advice on uh, how I should handle some of these issues. Some of them are pretty daunting. So thanks for watching. Fucking subscribe, like, whatever bullshit. And if you want to hear our music, it's all linked in the bottom here. All right, peace out, people. Thanks.